In the previous lecture, we, we introduced the small strain tensor and we defined it as follows. We said epsilon ij is equal to one half partial ui with respect to xj plus partial uj with respect to xi. Let's go ahead and call that equation one. What we want to talk about in in um, this particular lecture is what kinds of deformation uh, do we measure with strain? So, um, and, and what I want to show you is that this strain tensor is actually good for measuring those, uh, those types of deformation. So if you think about how you first learned about strain and, and go back to the previous lecture if you want to review, we, we talked about delta L over L, right? Well, what is formally delta L over L? It's simply a change in length. Okay, so one type of, uh, well, let me just give you the three types. Let's, let's think through those, okay? Uh, or maybe even we can say there's two primary types. Okay, and one is obviously what I just said, length changes. Okay, that, that tells us something about expansion and contraction, but you also know that uh, if you um, deform a material, it doesn't necessarily just have length changes. It could also have shape changes, right? And so the fundamental way we would talk about shape changes is by uh, what we will refer to as, as angle changes. And I'll define that a little bit more carefully later. And then I'll call this a third, uh, so uh, this is kind of a third, uh, can be thought of as, as sort of a, um, a subset actually of the length change, but it could be the change in volume, okay? Right, so if some pressure acts on something to compress it, then its volume is going to decrease. You might like to know that. And it is, you know, it's really a, some combination of length changes now in three dimensions. Okay. So we, we had previously drawn this picture, uh, with points deforming H and Q. Um, we're going to, we're going to go back to that, except in the case of the length change, we'll just draw the line. Okay. And we'll just look at how that changes. So here we go. Uh, this is for length changes. And for length changes, let's go ahead. Uh, let, let's doesn't have to be uh, any orientation in particular. We'll call this Q, and we'll call this H, uh, right? And we'll call this length D big S. Okay. Um, and then after some deformation, we let's say we have now a new uh, H and a new little Q, and the distance between that line is d little s, okay? Pretty simple, right? So under some deformation, that line moved to there. It changed the orientation, but it also changed its length. Since we're only focusing on length changes here at the moment, we want to ask, uh, how did that line change? And so uh, we'll give a definition of normal engineering strain like we've talked about previously. And we'll call normal engineering strain epsilon E. And I'll underline this so that you kind of know it's a, a definition. Okay, so the normal engineering strain epsilon E is defined as epsilon E is equal to D little s minus D big S divided by D big S, right? That's delta L over L. Let's call that equation two. Okay, so now what we're going to do uh, to see what we want to what we want to ask is how does that uh, strain tensor definition help us with this particular definition? So let's let n be a unit vector that runs from from h to q. Okay, so let's go up here and we'll write that this is dx. Okay, so we can write then that n is equal to dx divided by ds, okay? Call that equation three, so that's our n vector. So n is the unit vector that runs from uh, in the direction of q, uh, h to q rather. We define the normal engineering strain uh, is gonna be given by, as follows. We'll say that the engineering strain, and uh, maybe I'll put up here this is uh, in the, the unit, uh, in the direction of the normal defined by n is equal to n 
transpose times epsilon times n. Okay, I, I'm doing this without proof. I'm just telling you how to do it. Or you could write it as epsilon ij, uh, n i and j. Call that equation four. So what that means is that just like with um, this should hopefully remind you a little bit of what we talked about it with stress, right? This looks like a Cauchy stress formula, uh, then looking at the traction vector in the unit normal direction, very similar, right? Uh, there we had sigma ij and i and j gave, gave us the, the uh, normal traction on any plane defined by n. So using the strain tensor in the same way gives us the normal engineering strain on any plane defined by n. So we can, we can uh, again, confirm that our intuition is normal. Let's just look at the one direction, okay? So for instance, okay, let's consider uh, the one direction. So that would mean that uh, n is just going to be equal to 1, 0, 0, okay? Then uh, we can write the following. Right, so if we want to say what's the normal stress, the normal engineering stress uh, in the one direction, that will look like one zero zero, obviously times epsilon one one, epsilon one two, epsilon one three, epsilon two two, epsilon two three, epsilon three three. Of course, this is symmetric, and then times. 1, 0, 0, and we end up with that equaling epsilon 1, 1. Let's call that equation 5. Okay, so we can get the normal strain in any direction using that strain tensor, and I would suspect that you haven't ever done that before. You've always um, maybe rotated the strain tensor so that you could read the straight from the strain tensor off, but you don't need to. If you wanted to look at the normal strain in any direction defined by n, you can just apply this, this method. Okay. Now let's go to something a little bit more complicated. Let's talk about angle changes. To talk about angle changes, we have to have more than just h and q defining a point, because all we can really talk about is length. Um, we can talk about how that particular um, a line may have rotated uh, in space during deformation, but we, we can't really talk about how angles have changed in the body. So in order to do that, we have to consider two differential vectors. And, and for our purposes, we're going to orient those vectors along coordinate directions. Okay, and we'll call those coordinate directions, let's say x sub k and x sub l. Okay, so those could be, uh, you know, in, in any set of coordinate directions that you like, uh, such that, here we go, let me draw you a set of axes here. This would be the xk axis. This would be the xl axis. And we would choose a differential vector in line with those. So um, this would, this line here would be dxk. And this line here would be, I'll draw it up here, dxl, okay? Um, during some deformation, we are going to care about, I'm, draw, I'm exaggerating for effect, they obviously aren't going to do this in a small strain case, but in theory, those lines under, def, those, those uh, differential vectors under deformation could begin to point in different directions, and we would define that angle there as, as uh, beta, and maybe this one here as alpha, okay? So that's how it's going to deform. Uh, those, those, these vectors are gonna move to align with uh, these new lines, and they won't be orthogonal necessarily anymore. And so we're gonna then define um, the total angle that they've deformed, okay? So let's say let uh, delta theta kl uh, be equal to alpha plus beta. Okay, uh, let that. That's the total angle change during deformation. Okay, um, that angle change is related to the the 
a strain tensor that we defined above as follows. We would say that delta theta KL is equal to 2 times epsilon KL. We'll call that equation 6. And so you'll, you'll, you'll probably notice that this is now the definition, really, of the engineering she shear strain. It's going to be defined as our conventional gamma KL is going to be equal to 2 epsilon KL, which is equal to the angle change delta theta KL. Let's call this equation 7. And so what does that mean if you're trying to, if I, I will likely ask you at some point, okay, I want you to draw, uh, let's say a unit square, unit cube under a particular shear strain. How does that look? Um, so that what that's going to look like is just very simply. So if this is, let's say, x1 and this is x2, and I had an initial, uh, initial, square that looked like a material that looks like this that's supposed to be a square and I sheared it okay something like this that's supposed to be a straight line there's the deformed state okay this angle is gamma KL uh, or in this case it'll be just gamma 1 2 right so I expect you to know that 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 that's the case um, I'll also say that you can, you know, we put it in terms of coordinate system, um, you know, that, that, uh, we oriented it so that X1 and X2 could easily read this off. We can find the angle change between any two orthogonal angles, um, defined by N1 and N2. So I'll just say that, uh, generally, Uh, this is not something I'm going to test you on, but I just want to, for the sake of completeness, tell you. Uh, you can uh, compute uh, delta theta um, is equal to uh, what will be epsilon ij uh, n, I'm going to put it as 1 i n2 nj2. These are two different vectors. They're, but they're orthogonal. Okay, so this is any two orthogonal unit vectors. Okay, uh, you can compute the angle change between them under that deformation. Okay, um, so uh, where N1 and N2 are orthogonal. All right. So since I've introduced this definition of gamma, I want to make a, a distinction between gamma and epsilon. Okay, so here's here's just a remark on, on that. The epsilon, that's a tilde, epsilon is a second order tensor. Okay, and as such, it transforms as a tensor under coordinate rotation. Right, so what I mean by that is if you wanted to uh, find the primed system epsilon prime is going to be equal to uh, r um, I'll just put a tilde under it uh, even though it's not exactly as I've defined the tensor r r transpose times epsilon times r right so it transforms as a tensor um, you can call that equation eight if you want but the engineering sh shear strains those gamma terms do not rotate as tensors Okay, so what that means is if you want to rotate the strains and you have an engineering strain, you need to convert that engineering shear strain back into a, uh, into this, the epsilon, that strain tensor, and then apply the rotations and then recompute your engineering strains on the basis of twice those uh, off diagonal terms. Okay, so now let's move on to this final, uh, uh, subset really of length change but uh, we're going to count it kind of as a, as a third case and that's volume change okay so let's go ahead what, will, what will, if we have a differential volume element um, and that's that's really common right in engineering so it's going to have uh, it's going to be a cube with edges dx1 dx2 and dx3 
Okay, and so we can write that that initial volume of that differential element is just going to be equal to dx1 times dx2 times dx3. Okay, let's call that equation 9. And what we're going to do is we're going to define the volumetric strain as, we'll say epsilon sub v for volumetric is equal to uh, dv minus uh, dv naught divided by dv naught, right? Call that equation 10. Okay, and I'll just say where uh, dv is the volume after deformation. Okay, uh, we can compute the volumetric strain uh, by just summing the diagonals of the strain tensor. So we'd write epsilon of v is equal to, um, in this case, epsilon ii, where we've used Einstein's summation convention, and we just sum the diagonals, or we could write it as the trace of epsilon. Okay, let's call that equation 11. Okay, so that's how we can use the strain tensor to get length changes and angle changes, and then that subset of length changes in terms of uh, where we go to volume changes, okay? So that's uh, hopefully um, links maybe what you have learned before with, with a, the, the full definition of the strain tensor, uh, even though I acknowledge that we didn't actually derive how those uh, come about. Um, that's more of a topic for the, a continuum mechanics class than